www.usbr.gov forward slash pn slash forward slash fcrps forward slash lsrws.htm. And I will drop, uh, sounds like you guys can maybe see the chats. Thank you, Will. Um, so there's my email address that Will just popped into the chat. And then, Will, would you pop our website into the chat as well? That would be great. So your capture, so again, your questions will be captured as part of the webinar record, and your participation acknowledges your consent to be included. For the convenience of web participants, the final slide present in this presentation includes our information request email address. I will now turn the meeting over to Cynthia Karlstad for the next portion of the meeting. Cynthia? Great, thank you, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Cynthia Karlstad. I'm the outreach lead for the consulting team um, conducting the Lower Snake River Water Supply Replacement Study. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our agenda for this evening um, and then turn it over to the presenters. Um, so next slide, please. So um, our agenda includes an introductory background um, and federal and state Washington state commitment um, portion, um, which will be provided to you by Roland Springer of the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, Roland is the deputy regional director for the um, Columbia Pacific Northwest uh, region. And Tom Tebb, who is the Office of Columbia River Director for the State of Washington Department of Ecology. Um, following that, the consultant project manager, Ron Ferringer, with the Jacobs Engineering Group, will give a description of the study, um, which is just beginning. Um, following that, Roland will finish the evening um, with the formal presentation on providing opportunities for engagement um, through, that will occur throughout the study. And then we'll finish with questions and taking your questions and, and providing answers. Um, as Michael said in her introductory comments, please provide your questions to her via her email, and we'll be fielding those um, at, after the formal presentation. So Roland, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Cynthia, and I would want to thank all of you uh, for participating this evening, for taking time out of your va valuable day. Um, we are happy to share this information uh, with, with you and the others who will be able to view this presentation online. Uh, first, I will start with a bit of history on the federal commitment in relation to the water supply replacement study. Uh, will, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, going back a few years, uh, the federal agencies produced uh, an environmental impact statement, record of decision, and biological opinions on the Columbia River system operations. Uh, the, the agencies that were involved in that included Reclamation, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, Bonneville Power Administration, Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA Fisheries. Uh, in, in those documents, we included an, an, a variety of alternatives for the system. Uh, the preferred alternative in the EIS did not include breach of the four Lower Snake River dams owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, lawsuits were filed against the federal agencies related to that issue as well as other issues. Uh, so after those lawsuits were, uh, it were initiated, the agencies and the plaintiffs entered into a mediated process uh, through which an agreement was reached on December 14th of last year. The court did grant a litigation stay of five to 10 years this February. Uh, the agreement uh, that we uh, entered included federal commitments to evaluate how to address impacts of dam breach should that be operated authorized by Congress. Uh, specific to water supplies in this study that we are uh, talking about tonight, 
Uh, this slide quotes Reclamation's commitment to fund a water supply replacement study that would address impacts to irrigation, municipal, and industrial withdrawals affected by potential dam breach, uh, both in the states of Washington and Idaho. We are performing the study in partnership with the Washington Department of Ecology, as uh, Tom will discuss in the next slide, and the USDA uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service will serve in a review capacity as part of the team. Uh, Reclamation is committed to completing this analysis by the end of this year when we will have a draft report ready for stakeholder review. Uh, and we know this is a very tight timeline, so we appreciate um, our consultant partnering with us uh, as we go through the study. Uh, the work is being funded under the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, through the Aquatic Ecosystems Restoration Program, and we, we appreciate uh, the access to those funds. I will now turn uh, the mic over to Tom Tebb from Washington Department of Ecology to discuss the state of Washington's commitment and our partnership. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Roland, and I appreciate the, the introduction. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that during um, the legislative session, uh, supplemental legislative session in 2024, uh, the state operating budget included a provision uh, that provided some funding for the, the Department of Ecology to initiate a study of related impacts to water supply uh, related impacts should the uh, dams ever be breached. And so we, uh, as the Department of Ecology and the Office of Columbia River were identified to work on that project. And we actually started that project in terms of uh, looking for a solicitation for a contractor to help with us to help complete that study um, early on, actually, uh, as we approach the fall season of 2023. But once the um, once the the mediation by the federal government with the sovereigns was announced in mid December, uh, it made sense for ecology to step back and uh, you know discuss this with the governor's office and then reapproach. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation to partner in this agreement to work on a, a water supply impact study. So that's what we've done. We've essentially we've entered into a memorandum of agreement with the Bureau of Reclamation in February of 2024, and we're working to provide uh, 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 some funding, about $250,000 to the Bureau of Reclamation's $4.2 million to complete this study uh, in fiscal year 24 as a draft, and then we have an additional $250,000 uh, for fiscal year 25, should it be necessary to provide any additional data, um, um, uh, additional data needs or um, areas where we might need some more, more work. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our um, facilitation team and Roland. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, if we could advance to the next slide, please. So just a, a summary of what has been done to, to date, focusing now on this water supply replacement study. Um, as Tom mentioned, Reclamation and Ecology have, have uh, entered into a formal agreement uh, to co-sponsor the study. We awarded the contract uh, to the Jacobs team on April 26th. Uh, we've also conducted tribal orientation sessions and invite, invited tribes to consult on the study. Um, and then finally, we did announce these public sessions on June 14th. So we have been doing a lot of preparation for a successful study. Uh, you see the highlights on the slide here, but we are we are really excited to get going and and perform the technical work. And now I will turn it over to uh, Ron Ferringer from the consultant team as their lead. And uh, I'll, I'll again remind you that if you have questions for to for us to address at the end of the presentation, please email them to mcoffee at usbr.gov. Over to you, Ron. Thank, thanks, Roland. Yeah, my name is Ron Ferringer. I'm with the Jacobs Engineering Group, and I'm the project manager for the consultant team that's helping Reclamation and Ecology deliver this study. Next slide, please. I wanted to show you briefly uh, what this consultant team is comprised of. Um, so you can see here that Jacobs Engineering Group's the prime, and then we've got five sub consultants. 
this is a team working in an integrated fashion with reclamation and ecology. It's a team of experts that um, specialize in some of the really important elements of the project, like public involvement and facilitation, water rights, groundwater, river diversions and irrigation conveyance facilities, power supply and transmission, cost estimating and economic analysis. Next slide, please. This map shows generally the study area in southeast Washington and uh, partially into Idaho. Uh, broadly speaking, the study will evaluate the potential impacts on water supply in the event that the Snake River dams, the lower four Snake River dams were to be breached. We're talking here about, of course, Ice Harbor on the far left, Lower Monumental, Little Goose, and Lower Granite. The study will include analysis of alternatives for providing replacement irrigation, municipal and industrial, or MI water supplies. Next slide, please. So I wanted to briefly summarize the, the content of the study, and then I'll get into the details um, of some of the different stages. Uh, generally, if one or more of the four lower snake dams were to be breached, the reservoirs and the groundwater that provide access to water to some of the irrigation interests and m &I interests around the dams could be lowered by roughly 100 feet and the river would then look a whole lot more like a fleet, it would be a whole free flowing state. So we're going to investigate, first of all, the water availability, given seasonal flow variations and given future climate change projections. And we will quantify the economic benefits associated with water supply for irrigation and m &I. And the study will also then investigate potential sources of water that could be used for replacement and develop alternative solutions to get that water to these parties that divert it presently that would be otherwise impacted. And a key part of the effort uh, will include the development of pre-feasibility level designs and costs for selected alternatives. And we'll be looking at implementation issues also that address how water supply would be handled during a multi-year process of transitioning to the new water supply, including sediment in the river and phasing of construction. Next slide, please. Just in general, I wanted to go over the kind of the task uh, list here and uh, the scope and schedule for the study. The first part of the study includes what we're doing here today with these public inter and tribal information sessions. Very shortly, we're going to be going out and conducting a series of interviews and site visits with some of the affected parties. And then there are going to be four study sections that address water supply and water availability, strategies for replacement, and analyzing these implementation issues. Then, of course, we'll be doing all the requisite reporting uh, of all the findings of the study. Overall, the study is intended to fulfill one of the several commitments made by the government on December 14, 2023, uh, in their agreement to stay litigation on the Columbia River Systems Operation, System Operations, or, or CRSO. In accordance with that agreement, known as the Resilient Columbia Basin Agreement, a public draft report is planned for the end of this calendar year 2024 and as roland alluded to this is a really short time frame for a complex large study which will then uh inform some of the milestone dates that you see here on on the chart on the chart um, over the next several slides we're going to discuss in more detail how each of these sections of the study are planned to unfold so next slide please Study section one is an analysis of the current water supply. It's, it's a thorough analysis of uh, the water supply, including 
collecting a bunch of water rights data, geospatial data, other types of data to understand how surface water and groundwater use in the study area take place, how the ag lands are irrigated with this water and recent crop patterns and their acreages. Data will be combined and validated and then augmented as needed to help us with the analysis. And then we're also going to be conducting, as I mentioned a minute ago, these in-person and on-site interviews of various types of water users to ground truth all the information we're collecting. Another key outcome of the study will be an analysis of, of this stage of the study will be an analysis of potential changes to the economic benefits. Next slide, please. Study section two is water availability analysis. Along with the understanding of water use in the prior study section, this study section two involves understanding the availability of both surface water and groundwater resources. It's critical that we understand not just for current conditions and existing hydro regulation rules and operations, but also for future climate predictions. So the Jacobs team will use the best available science and methods to analyze not only how flows could vary during the short term in a potentially free flowing river, but also how natural flows are likely to vary from year to year. This will help us estimate long term water availability, water availability and also look at the future climate projections. And it's also going to help help us gain a better understanding of potential impacts to groundwater wells in the study area. Next slide, please. Study section three is where we identify and analyze potential solutions for water supply replacement. In a nutshell, we are looking at options for replacing water supply that is supported by existing water rights. So the Jacobs team is going to think creatively and develop a large list of potential water replacement alternatives while also looking at and drawing upon work documented in lots of previous studies performed by others. The list of options will be workshopped with technical experts on our team and reclamation and ecology. We want to converge on a shorter list of alternatives that we will advance to a pre-feasibility pre level of design and cost estimating. These designs and estimates will be high level. They're not going to be overly detailed and they're not going to be feasibility level or decisional yet at this point. Potential alternatives could include uh, new intakes and in pump or booster stations at individual diversions, uh, one or more consolidated pump stations, a consolidated diversion near the present day lower granite pool, and then gravity distribution systems to existing places of use. They could include uh, transitioning to groundwater. They could include taking irrigated lands out of production with partial buyouts. And also wanted to mention that the focus is the lower snake, but to be creative and to be complete, we're also going to look at other potential water sources. Next slide, please. Study section four is identification and analysis of potential implementation issues associated with uh, potential dam breaching and then the you know water supply replacement strategies. So we're going to analyze, identify, and analyze and describe solutions for potential challenges with replacing or modifying existing water supply infrastructure and it's going to help us outline issues for future analysis of impacts and it can inform any future evaluations and decision making one key issue that's been identified from past and ongoing work is the engineering analysis of the transition from current conditions to the potential free-flowing river condition including 
considerations for how water supply needs will be met during such a transition. We anticipate it would be a multi-year process of transitioning to the new water supply. So the analysis is going to look at construction sequencing that could be needed for this transitionary period. There are numerous considerations to include and accommodate here, including potential impacts to irrigated agriculture and other and other landowners. Uh, concerns and benefits surrounding the movement and transport of sediment is another crucial issue that we're going to address in th this sec section of the study, particularly with respect to potential impacts to the water users in the McNary pool. We don't anticipate the study will include predictive high-end sediment modeling, but instead we plan to build on and expand the body of, existing body of work, including developing a, an initial concept model, compiling and synthesizing available information, uh, developing sediment management alternatives, sediment management alternatives. And then overall, the task includes developing an analytical approach and a framework for a future NEPA impact analysis by resource that would be required eventually, uh, including water rights. This sets the stage for future environmental compliance work that would be required um, th sorry, I, hang on, I lost my place. That would be required uh, prior to any federal action and future assessment of cultural resources and tribal I issues associated with implementing a solution. Next slide, please. So just a quick snapshot of some of the key data sources and references that we're working with. We recognize that many, many studies and have been completed and there are other ongoing efforts related to the study. And we plan to use these data sources and build on them to uh, achieve the objectives of the study. This is just a subset here showing up little snapshots on the screen. of Some of the more widely known studies dating back more than 20 years, including the Army Corps of Engineers Lower Snake River Juvenile Salmon Migration Feasibility Study from 2002. Joint Federal Agency CRSO FEIS in 2020. Phase two report from the Columbia Basin Partnership Trust uh, Task Force of the Marine Fisheries Advisory Committee from October of 2020. Lower Snake River Dam's Benefit Replacement Report commissioned by Senator Murray and Governor Inslee. Various technical memoranda and conceptual analyses developed by the Bureau of Reclamation and other agencies. And then an analysis completed by the Columbia Snake River Irrigation Irrig Irrigators Association in uh, 2023 and into 2024. And of course, there will be many, many other data sources and reference material leveraged as well. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you a brief snapshot of near term work activities, things that are going on right now in the study as we get going. We're currently working hard assembling large amounts of data around water rights, geospatial data, and other data from previous studies, uh, existing water rights databases, and similar sources. We're evaluating or validating and augmenting all these data sets. Soon we'll be conducting these water user interviews that I mentioned earlier to gather some valuable insight and uh, validate information from some of these data, existing data sources. And the, inter the interviews will be held with a range of large to small irrigators, tribal water users, and municipal and industrial water users. So we're asking if you have information that would be important for the evaluation, please let us know. That would be helpful uh, in executing the study. At that point, I will hand it back over to Roland. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that overview of the uh, technical work. And again, we look forward to, to all the work that will be done over the course of this year. Uh, just wanted to close out our formal presentation uh, with a reminder of the engagement opportunities uh, that, that we have designed into the project. 
Uh, first of all, we do have the uh, tribal and public information sessions that we are holding this week. Uh, then once we put the um, draft report together and have that compiled, uh, we will have that available for for review of that draft in late 2024 into early 2025. And, um, and then as, as you see at the bottom of this slide here, that review period will last for a number of weeks. So it should give uh, people ample time to review the document uh, prior to finalization. Uh, one of our requirements within Bureau of Reclamation is uh, for studies of this nature, we do need to complete an independent peer review. So that will be um, happening concurrently with the, uh, the, the public review that we will have available. And again, uh, just in, in regards to engagement, we do we will appreciate any information you have that could help strengthen the study, especially from people or organizations that use water along the Lower Snake River. And as mentioned before, we have an email address on the website. Uh, we we used uh, Michael Coffey's email uh, for questions on uh, during this presentation, uh, but we encourage you if you have any more input for us that you use uh, the email that's located on the website. And I believe we will show that at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, I will turn it over uh, to uh, Cynthia as we go into uh, the the, uh, the question period. Great, thank you, Roland, and thank you to all of the presenters. Um, so I'm just going to remind folks how we're going to handle the questions this evening. Um, so you should email your questions to Michael Coffey's email address that's shown in the chat. It's at mcoffey, M-C-O-F-F-E-Y, at usbr.gov. Um, Michael will read off the questions, and I'll help direct those to the appropriate um, subject matter expert. Um, and um, I think we have one, a question or two so far, Michael. Yeah, we do. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, Matthew Weaver has uh, actually several questions. He is with Capital Press. Uh, the first of his questions is, what will this study add or do differently compared to previous studies? Did you wanna take all of them at once or one at a time? I, I think one at a time would probably, because his are pretty wide ranging. Okay, okay, perfect. Roland, I wonder if you want, might wanna start with that question and then Ron, um, you may have some additional thoughts to add. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I would say that there have been a number of studies as Ron mentioned in his presentation and uh, they, they have all gone to uh, varying levels of details, but really with, with this study, we want to add another layer of, layer of detail where we do a complete analysis of all the issues that would relate to water supply replacement and also uh, prepare some uh, more uh, in engineering or conceptual design alternatives that could be referred to in a solution. So uh, there's a lot of information out there already we recognize, but we want to take it to the next level uh, to help inform any potential decisions in the future. Great, thanks. And Tom, did you want to add anything to that from the state perspective before we uh, go to Roland? No, I, I think Roland answered that really well. I think it's an opportunity really to capture all of the previous work and again, you know, look a little bit, uh, you know, deeper in detail around potential solutions and pre-feasibility uh, ideas and, and, and designs that we hope that the contractor will help us with. Great. Thanks, Roland. Yeah, I can add that uh, our study is really focused almost entirely on uh, water supply replacement. A lot of the other studies looked at other services provided by the dam. Um, and I think we're going to put the ener a lot of energy into updating and synthesizing the previous work and then add more detail around cost and economics and things like that. Great, thank you. Okay, Michael, next question. Yeah, so again from Matthew, um, agricultural and electrical stakeholders have criticized much of the federal mediation process for leaving them out of the discussions. 
How much consideration will this study give to agricultural stakeholder input, i.e. the loss of barging, increased power cost, impacts to land value, et cetera? Thanks. And just to remind folks, this is a water supply replacement study, so it does not focus on the transportation elements and some of the other pieces. But Roland, maybe you want to address that in more detail? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the question. I know there's a lot of interest in and more than the water supply replacement aspects of this. I will say that this this study being led by reclamation ecology is focused on the water supply replacement. Uh, there are other uh, federal studies that have been committed to to address some of the other issues that would be related to uh, a dam breach scenario. Uh, so um, the Corps of Engineers is, is doing one focused on transportation as well as recreation. And we also have Department of Energy focusing on some of the energy issues. So I, you know, I, I can't speak to their processes uh, because they're, 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 not, they're, they're not the reclamation studies, but I recognize that they are, um, that those are also being initiated. Mm -hmm. Ron, I wonder if you want to just describe a little more detail around kind of the the extent of the water user interviews and this, you know, kind of site system information um, surveys that we'll be doing as part of this study. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mentioned that um, we're going to be going out on a series of interviews, uh, site visits uh, with quite a few representative uh, Water users out there from the ag community and also the MI community get you know talking to them specifically about how they divert the water, how they use the water, uh, the ag land value, you know, how that water supply and the ag land value are linked, looking at all those things and developing uh, our analysis of water supply and water use, and then these uh, replacement alternatives, uh, water supply replacement alternatives tying all that stuff together. So um, we're also looking at economic conditions with and without, uh, you know, with dams not breached and when then with dams potentially breached, trying to make sure we cover all those scenarios in the economic analysis. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just insert a quick reminder here that if folks are wondering how to get your questions in the queue, um, the, the way to do that is to email your question to Michael Coffey. That's M-C-O-F-F-E-Y at usbr.gov. Um, Michael, more questions on that list? Yes, there are oh, questions coming oh, in. Sorry. Oh. Can, can I add just one, one other thing? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, Roland. Yeah, th thank you for the... Uh, the, your answer, Ron, and I will say that as we scoped uh, this effort out on the federal side, we recognize the importance of getting input um, from the users of the water, from the agricultural community, uh, the others that you know, use uh, the pools behind uh, those four lower Snake River dams uh, to provide a water supply. So um, I, I, we think it's very important to get that information. And and, and again, if if you are, are among that group or you know folks in the group that could provide information, again, we would we would really appreciate you forwarding information along so our consultant team can make those connections. Good ad. Yeah, definitely. Yep. All right, Michael, next question. Okay, so um, the last question from Matthew is, how much information are you using from Columbia Snake River Irrigators Association's studies? Ron, I think we'll send that one directly to you. It was listed on the slide as one of the very important uh, resource documents, so go ahead. Yeah, and, and I'll say, uh, you know, a lot of information. We plan to really pour through that. We already have, and we're going to continue to, to uh, you know, utilize that as much as we can. We, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel on alternatives and different elements of the analysis. So we're planning to utilize that and some of the other studies that I mentioned in in great detail. It's it's one of those sources of data that we'll be drawing upon and cross referencing, but it's not going to be the only source. Um, we, we've got a lot of information to work with and. I think some of it's still coming in. Plus, as I mentioned, we're going to you know, gather a lot of intel from our interviews and our site visits. 
Thanks. And Tom, I wonder if you want to just make any comments around that. I, I think I believe OCR funded that study or a portion of it. Yeah, um, we did. We we worked with uh, Dr. Olson and the Columbia Snake River Irrigators, as well as the Franklin County Conservation Dist District um, in 2023 in an effort really to try to update their benchmark study that they had done a couple of years previously and trying to, uh, you know, provide as the most recent information as uh, that we could to help provide an additional data source for this larger study. Great, thank you. Okay, Michael. Okay, yes. Um, so I will make a, a note at this point. Um, there are a couple of you that have sent multiple emails with questions and that's great appreciate that but just know that um i'm responding to your emails in the order that i receive them so um you know for example matthew um put a, a several questions in one email um i will respond to the emails themselves and the questions in those emails as i receive them so there, you you may not receive all of your responses to your questions all at the same time, if that makes sense to you. Um, so the next um, set of questions comes from uh, Casey Mahaffey from Clearing Up. Um, her first question is, how large is the study area roughly in acres? Uh, I, give us, who should I send that to? That Any... <laughs> well, I, think I we'll can get go. That for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll go. I mean, we're looking at anywhere from 53 or 50,000 acres all the way up to 93,000 acres, I think was the higher number that was in the Columbia Snake River Irrigators report. We definitely want to understand the difference between the McNary and the Ice Harbor pools which will be part of some of our field interview work that we'll be doing this summer. So I, I, I think it's a range, um, but I'll I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over to, to the consultant and to Reclamation to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add or say that we haven't really completely determined that yet. And Tom already alluded to the range and we're in the early stages of, you know, still analyzing and crunching the data to figure out exactly who all is affected as best we can. And, and, uh, and then, you know, we'll have a better sense of that number. OK, Michael, next question. OK, yeah. So next um, question from Casey is um, how many of those acres are in active agriculture? Ron, do we have a sense of that yet? I don't know. It's, that a, we... it's, a, it's another one where we're working on it uh, as we speak. It's, you know, we're very early, just started crunching a lot of those numbers, don't have the values yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right, Michael. Next okay. question. And then next question from Casey is how many different municipal or industrial water users are there in the study area? Ron, I think <laughs> I can, can I hit, re can I hit repeat? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's you know the same answer. We're we're direct dis discerning that right now. Uh but um you know, we're hoping that the interviews on site help and dozen or more dozens. Uh, it's, it's a it's a number we're working on. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I will add that the primary source of information for this is, you know, we have state's water right databases for both Washington and Idaho. And so that is, you know, that's the first source to go for, you know, the, the number of diversions, that type of information. So we've we've um, we and the consultant team have already looked at that information. We don't have the exact numbers in front of us, but that's the type of information that would be. Uh, prepared and shared in the study. Okay, yeah, next question. Have you already identified alternatives? Ron, I'll send that one to you. No, we have not yet. That is a, an upcoming activity on, on our part uh, after we finish the the interviews and site visits to really and, and you know complete our analysis of the data right now we're out there scouring through the water rights information a lot of other things to gather up that information about 
you know, essentially who to interview, what's a good representative cross section of parties to interview, gather all that information, go out and look at some of the facilities and then start thinking about what the universe of alternatives might look like. And then, as I mentioned, when I was talking earlier, you know, workshopping that with reclamation and ecology to kind of arrive at a at a representative sample of alternatives to address the water supply replacement strategies. Uh, nothing is predetermined at this point. Nothing's been left off the table or guaranteed on the table, either one. Thank you. And we, and we we have provided information uh, to to the consultant team on existing alternatives that have been identified through the number of studies that were shared. So, you know, recognizing that that's that's a good source of information, uh, but it's not the only source and it's not limiting what is being looked at either. Great. OK, um, Ron mentioned that in addition to the Lower Snake River area, other water sources will be looked at. Can you tell me what other water sources will be considered? Is Lake Roosevelt among them? I uh, I would probably defer that answer to to, to Roland. I, I, would, I would before I do, though, nothing's off the table yet. We're looking at at. Uh, or we're prepared to look at that as uh, along with other things. So, Roland, I don't know if you want to add any more color to that. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, recognizing this is a study at this point, we don't want to limit any any potential solutions. And so, uh, of course, uh, the Snake River is the existing water source. So that's the primary source that would be looked at. But if there are other sources, um, they could be looked at as well. We recognize there's lots of limitations on water throughout the basin. Um, but we're not constraining what sources would be looked at. But but in addition to looking at them, uh, we would also identify um, where there are issues or problems or or even positive aspects of using other water sources. So right now we are not limiting um, what is looked at for the study. Okay. And I can and add I, that, I can add that groundwater is of course an option there among others. So. Yeah, and I, I think that actually covers her final question, and that is, are there other major water sources you're looking at? Yeah, I think that did. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, um, the, the, next, um, the next set of questions, um, this is from um, Greg Chartrand. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, I, I profusely apologize. Um, first, he says there are far there are far more dams, far more to the dams than just irrigation. So, to what extent will your study address the points below, and specifically the extent by which substitutes for the uh, for the below will be addressed? So, the first is what mechanisms will you use to assure your study is accurate? Who will evaluate the results of the study to also review its accuracy? Ron, this might be a good place to describe the peer review that is included as part of um, this study. Yes, one of the parts of the project that's been in place, you know, from the beginning as reclamation and ecology uh, scope this out is to conduct a, a formal peer review step as we get alternatives formed up and documents prepared and you know we're getting close to that uh, public draft uh, at the end of the year we're going to conduct a peer review uh, process with some uh, subject matter experts in you know various parts of the uh, project that you know the irrig uh, irrigation specialists and uh, electrical power specialists and many others to pull them together uh, we, we also have NRCS that's going to be reviewing it and uh, just it's going to get thorough review by uh, a, a, a large team of individuals uh, within the consultant team as well as reclamation and ecology and NRCS and we believe it'll be a pretty thorough and uh, defensible study uh, again focusing on irrigation focusing on irrigation water supply m and water supply, not the dams themselves, not the breaching itself, but water supply impacts 
should breaching occur. Thanks. Okay. And, and oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to clarify really quickly, Cynthia. Um, for those who do who do not know, NRCS is Natural Resources Conservation Service. Thank you. Good point. Good point. And uh, Tom and Roland, I wonder if you maybe just want to say a few words about the review period and the opportunities for um, public input um, during that phase. I, I can go. Um, I, uh, I I mentioned uh, during the presentation that we will have that public review uh, period where stakeholders can review the document and pro provide input as well. Uh, we're we recognize that that can take a, a little while to to review and provide comments. So um, we hope to have ample time available uh, for that review uh, in, in in the early stages of 2025. Yeah, I would just add that we will have a, a you know a link on our our ecology uh, website also to link to the 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 document itself in draft form and as well as have an opportunity for folks to submit comments directly either to us or to reclamation um, so we'll be making sure that we have that that open and available folks to to look at that so we're, we're the, the the review of this report at the end of this year is going to be critical and we really need the public's input and uh, as well as um, of course our tribal tribal partners thank you okay great okay, Okay, the next one is you say you will use science. Who qualifies those performing the study? Ron, do you want to respond to that with how we've configured the team and quality quality assurance measures there? Yeah, I, we formed the team from the beginning of industry leaders really in all the things that matter here in terms of subject matter experts who specialize in river and reservoir diversions, uh, power supply, power transmission, cost estimating, analyzing sediment issues and construction sequencing issues and other critical things that affect how the water supply projects would be determined and what they would cost and how they would be implemented. We have, um, Lots of people on here with 30 plus years of experience that are going to be guiding and executing the study. And the agencies uh, that we're working with here are going to be uh, providing a lot of expertise as well um, as we do this. So uh, we, we're working even right now as we speak uh, with Reclamation's water management modeling groups at the Technical Services Center, et cetera. Um, so We've got a lot of expertise uh, from the consultant team as well as the agencies involved here that we, we're very, very confident that uh, we've got the right people looking at this with the right uh, skill sets, qualifications, and the quality of the product is something that uh, we're very, very focused on. And we want something that's defensible and that's going to make sense to everybody. Thank you. Michael? I, I, oh, go ahead, Roland. Maybe I should raise my hand when I want to butt in. Thank you. Uh, um, I will add that uh, Reclamation is part of awarding uh, this effort to the Jacobs team. We did receive proposals for a num from a number of consulting groups. And as we uh, evaluated the proposals, we did con uh, consider the the quality of the experience of of the teams as well as the individual on the, the individuals on the teams as we uh, made the selection of the contractor. So there there was that in place too as we awarded this contract. Right, Michael. Okay, next. so the next question is, um, you talk about assembling advantages. Who will assemble disadvantages so that there is a balance of information to assure accuracy and that decisions are comprehensive? Ron, do you want to speak a little bit about the alternatives uh, analysis kind of process? Well, I think that's something that we're still figuring out, but, you know, whoever asked the question is right. Every alternative has a set of advantages and disadvantages. And when we when we put together our, our 
master list of everything we can kind of think of. We're going to be we're going to be going through and sorting that out. We want to definitely uh, get a good cross section representation of all the different kinds of things that might make sense out there, and then evaluate all the aspects of that, including benefits, including costs, and including advantages, disadvantages. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add, but that's probably how I would start by answering that one. I think you covered it. Michael, next question. OK, your actions appear to be too um, far too accelerated given the enormous long term impacts and for that reason appears to not be balanced. Uh, justify the need to accelerate these actions. Tom, do you want to speak a little bit about the legislative deadline? Yeah, I, I can uh, speak just a little bit about the state legislative uh, proviso. It, it directed ecology to have uh, a, at a minimum a draft report by the end of the calendar year of 2024. So that was kind of our interest and in, in negotiating uh, a partnership with Reclamation. Um, we we uh, requested um, this date as part of the deliverables, uh, recognizing that we'd have a extensive opportunity for peer review as well as public comment on the draft report, and then provide an opportunity to clean those up or provide any uh, any missing data or information uh, to be able to address that early in 2025 and then publish the report uh, by June of 2025. So that that was a little bit on our part as directed by the state legislature, but I'll I'll defer to to uh, reclamation on any further clarification. Yes, uh, thanks for that answer, Tom. And I would add that, that I, I think that's a, a very insightful question. Uh, this is, th these are very important questions we're dealing with here and um, you know, long term uh, consequences of any decisions that are made. Uh, this was a commitment uh, in, in negotiations on the litigation. That's how uh, this deadline was was arrived at. But I will recognize there's there's a, a number of studies that are being done in the short term, recognizing that that issues and and questions uh, will will prob will will remain uh, afterwards. And so this this information generated here will provide a really good basis of of information uh, going beyond what we have right now to inform uh, later conversations, uh, later discussions about congressional authorization, authorization and those types of things. So uh, there there could be uh, additional uh, studies or work following this, uh, but uh, the, the intent here is to provide some some really good information at, at, a, at a very quick pace, I will say. Um, based on the commitments that we made uh, in the December 14th agreement. Thank you. I do want to mention um, we're at 658 and I think this meeting was advertised to be one hour, um, but our team is available here to stay um, at least another half hour. So um, not to put any sort of um, damper on the questions and conversations. So appreciate that um, everyone's interest. Uh, Michael, do you have another question there? And yes, yeah, so I do want to make a point uh, here that um, some of the emails that I am getting do have comments, um, things that um, the audience feels should be fully considered. Um, we will not get into comments and opinions at this time, but let me assure you that um, the comments that are in your emails will be um, forwarded on to the presenters of this meeting. Um, and just just so that they are aware of uh, your concerns and um, can address them moving forward as part of the study. Um, partic in particular, the authorized purposes of the Lower Snake River dams. Um, OK, um, on to more questions. Um, let's see.
I noticed that the study content only talks about irrigation. What about energy and transportation that these dams provide? According to BPA, hydropower provides 60% of the energy to the Pacific Northwest and 90% of its clean energy. What is going to replace that? And don't say wind and solar because we don't want power that is weather dependent. Roland, do you want to again address the related studies? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, we recognize that the water supply isn't the only um, equity that would be impacted by uh, any dam breach decisions. Um, I, I will say in relation to water supply, it's irrigation as well as municipal and industrial uses as well. Uh, but the other items listed in the questions, such as, you know, there's transportation, there's power, there's recreation. Uh, there are other studies being performed by uh, our sister agencies. Uh, the Corps of Engineers and Department of Energy in relation to those equities. We recognize those are a very important part of the overall equation. Thank you. Michael, next question. Yeah, um, actually, Cynthia, I'm going to take this one. Um, it was how was this virtual meeting notification disseminated? Um, so we uh, we sent out a joint news release, the Bureau of Reclamation and the um, Department of Ecology. We did send out a news release with the information in it. Um, that news release was disseminated to all uh, news outlets in the states of Idaho and Washington. Um, so just, just so you're aware, that's how that notification came about. Um, OK, um, the other thing that I would ask is that um, in the comments um, and questions, I do ask that um, your um, your questions do remain professional and um, and um, there there's there's just no need to not be professional. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I see that no data sources and references from BPA have been included. Why is that? Uh, I'll, I'll speak, I'll speak yeah. up just briefly. I, I may need to you know, get a little input from others, but I, I don't believe that um, it doesn't mean there won't be any. We just uh, don't see BPA normally providing input on things like on things like water supply. So we're going to use streamflow data from them and task two, but um, again, not expecting them to be a primary source of information as it relates specifically to water supply, which is primarily where we're at with, you know, the kinds of information we're looking for some some of these agencies to provide. Thanks. Um, anybody have anything that they want to add to that? I, I would just say that we wouldn't preclude any uh, additional information as it relates to the purpose of the study from Bonneville or any other source for that matter. Thank you. Okay, Michael, next okay. question. Yeah. Yeah, the, the next question um, from Stephen Pfeiffer with Idaho Rivers United. Given the large body of pre-existing data sources and reports the study is able to draw upon, has the feasibility of engaging study sections three and four concurrently with sections one and two, as opposed to waiting until the fall, has that been ex has, has that been examined? Ron, I think that's probably a question for you. Uh, we've started sections one and two already and it's not going to be an end-to-end -end thing i think there's going to be overlap um but we needed to definitely uh complete parts of of sections one and two and some of the data gathering from the some of the, the existing irrigators and and m i folks before we get too far into developing alternatives which is where three and four focus. Uh, we need to have an understanding of points of diversion and points of use before we move very far forward. And that's one of the things we're doing right now in in task in uh, study sections one and two. 
Thank you. All right, Michael, next question. Okay, um, how will the study collect the water rights and user data for the Idaho portion of the study area? Is Washington Department of Ecology's counterpart at Washington Department of, uh, at Idaho Department of Water Resources involved? Roland, that's probably best for you to address initially, and Ron, you may want to add to that, but. Yes, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. th that's a good question. We recognize, you know, there are there are uses in Idaho that are important as well. Uh, we have uh, shared information about this study with Idaho Department of Water Resources, the Idaho Water Resource Board, and uh, and and some some of the uh, I know the irrigation users up in the Lewiston area. Uh, so we. we see the Idaho information as being just as important as the Washington information, and we have access to uh, the, the the databases, the, the public information on water rights uh, held within Idaho. So uh, recognize that while there is a former partnership, uh, sorry, a formal partnership with the state of Washington, we also um, value our, our working relationships within the state of Idaho, and we want the, the study to be just as robust uh, in its Idaho coverage as it is within its Washington coverage. And Cynthia, I can just add that we are going to be working a little bit with IDWR and other entities to ground truth the data for Idaho because the date the there are Idaho diversions that are going to be affected um, or would be affected in this situation. So we are going to be working with a couple of those parties for, for sure. Thank you. OK, Michael, next question. OK, and that um, just so you know, that question was from Joe Kaufman with the city of Lewiston. Oh, great. OK. Um, let's see. OK. Um, so I, I think this um, this question has been um, answered before, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it again. This is from Karen Brunn. Um, the, this whole study is centered around water replacement, but totally ignores the replacement of hydropower energy the dams provide. What's with that? Yeah, so I think we have, yeah, we mm -hmm. have addressed that, but Roland, maybe you wanna just reiterate the power study. Yeah, and I recognize you know we've we've shared that these other studies are ongoing, and we also recognize that those those uses and those benefits of the Lower Snake River dams are very very important to the economy, uh, to the people that live in in you know along the Lower Snake River in the Tri Cities in Lewiston, and it's not this isn't a single dimensional question. Although we are we are answering we are putting answers together for various uh, various impacts, I will say. But they will all be included in together as as you know, further considerations of you know the dam breach issue continue. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, and just a reminder that uh, some of your emails do have commentary and opinions. All of that information will be forwarded to our consulting firm and to the other presenters on this call. So just be aware that that your comments will be. Uh, taken into consideration. Okay, this one is from Ken Thompson. Uh, to what extent will in-stream flow requirements of aquatic life following dam breach be considered and how those requirements might be regulated? Ron, I think that's probably part of our water availability. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if I can do a phone a friend here. If Devin is able, Devin Stoker is able to answer. Uh, this is exactly what he's focusing on with his part of the team right now. I'm not sure if he is able to um, unmute and answer this one directly. If not, we can try to answer it, you know, later in some of the next steps we take. Devin, are you able to unmute and come on camera? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I'll try my camera here. All right. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. I'm Devin Stoker. I'm on the Jacobs team. Um, so I would answer that question by just kind of outlining what we're working on with the flow data as a part of task two. Um, 
trying to kind of establish what the availability of water looks like in you know current conditions and in a potential free flowing riverine condition um you know primarily we're looking at you know i, I understand the question was kind of phrased at looking at um options well so it's related to water rights for in-stream uses and so we're we're looking at replacing you know water supply supported by in existing water rights um there's a whole lot more that goes into that relative to climate change projections into the future and uh yeah, some some modeling exercises um but yeah that'll all be taken into account and documented in our studying and reporting if that answers the question yeah and devin there's a second half of that question how will those requirements how might those requirements be regulated i i can try to answer that a little bit okay devin if you'd like um first i want to Thanks, say Tom. that the department of state washington department of fish and wildlife has have provided recommended in-stream flow uh requirements for the snake river uh, I know them as swizzles. I'm not sure exactly what that uh, stands for in terms of uh, 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 in-stream flow nomenclature. But when any time that uh, any additional water resources or water allocations are considered out of the Snake River Basin, we review those recommendations. They're not um, an in-stream flow rule, which would then be protected as a, a water right, if you will but those recommendations are strongly adhered to and um, considered in any kind of future water allocation decision. So in terms of regulation, um, there could be a, a, a moment in time where a in-stream flow rule could be proposed for the Lower Snake River uh, at such a time uh, that if that were to happen, that rule would then uh, constitute a water right, and that water right would have a priority date of of when that rule was established under Western Western water law. So I, I hope that's helpful. I think that does answer the question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Devin. Michael, next um, question. Yeah, um, so this is from uh, Dr. Holtz Olson. Um, Two, two questions. Um, would you please explain what you mean by creative alternatives uh, like such as? And you mentioned new EIS, like what? So Ron, maybe I'll let you uh, um, speak to the creative solutions, um, which I'm guessing are creative because they're not developed yet. Um, and Roland, maybe you can address the, the EIS part of the question. Yeah, so what I'm getting at with the statement of creative, it uh, really what we're trying to say here is we're not going to rule anything out. We are going to be we're going to you know do some brainstorming, try to think of things that um, maybe haven't been contemplated before. Certainly, starting though with things that have been looked at before. As we mentioned, we're not going to reinvent the wheel here. We're going to try to focus on an initial list. It's stuff that have people have developed that have made some sense, if not entirely made sense. And then, yeah, think about anything else that might work or might be worth considering. And we just want to come up with a, a, a broad enough range to represent a lot of possible outcomes and then sort through those in a in a strategy sessions with our with our reclamation and, and ecology client and our uh, team of experts to, to think about what to proceed with um and you know we're going to try to work in face-to-face -face dialogue with some of our water user groups to discuss alternatives as well uh, there may be ideas out there that uh, we can uh, gin up from folks that uh, will make sense to continue to analyze or to carry forward within this as well roland do you want to uh, look at the discuss the eis part of that question Yes, yeah, I think thanks for that answer, Ron. In relation to an EIS, uh, one, one of I will say one of the commitments in the litigation uh, stay agreement from December of last year was that the agencies would review the environmental compliance and uh, 
supplement or or um, take you know, do other compliance as needed based on some of the activities early in this process. So that is something that the agencies are reviewing. So um, minimum, we are reviewing what, what environmental compliance needs exist right now uh, based on, I will say, changes since 2020. Um, but then there could be uh, additional environmental compliance needs later on if we get to, you know, feasibility studies or or other types of of efforts uh, that result from some of this early work. So we just recognize that that there is a commitment and additional uh, requirements could could uh, evolve as as we continue over the next few years. Great. And I'll I'll jump in, Cynthia, with one more thought. I mean, right back to the alternatives and creativity and so forth. I think certainly we're inviting public input for any potential ideas to the reclamation e email address for folks that might not end up being engaged during the interview process, interviewing process. So um, we're going to be taking the information we can from various different steps and sources and parties and trying to, again, distill it into the right uh, group that rep is good representation for the purposes of the study. Thanks for that. Let's do a quick time check here. We're at 7.15 and I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we we let our participants know when we're going to kind of have to cut off the flow of questions. Michael, could you give me a sense of how many you have? Um, just ballparkish. Let's see, I have um, probably just um, maybe half dozen more questions, and I do want to say that I, I, I appreciate everyone's patience um, as we work through these. But yeah, we're we're probably sitting pretty good, Cynthia, I think. OK, so we're probably going to have to cut off the inflow of questions to Michael's email at this point in order for us to wrap up by 7.30. Um, and really, again, appreciate everybody's interest and um, willingness to stay on on a, on a Tuesday evening. Uh, Michael, next question. Yeah, this is from Daniel Sturgis with um, Idaho uh, Department of Water Resources. Um, his first question is, how far into Idaho will the study extend both along the Snake River and the Clearwater River? I think... <laughs> yeah, I'll try on that. And again, if others want to jump in, I, I think it's uh, as far as the lower granite pool uh, extends. So you can imagine the, the lower granite dam creates a pool and that any degree of breaching would lower that pool. So anybody above that pool or out, above the elevation of that pool would not really be affected here uh, based on the objectives of the study. And then, you know, Taking that one step further, you know, this is back to some of the data we're crunching right now to get a little bit more precise around that um, that question. So I hope that answered it. I think it's best we can now at this point in the study, probably. <laughs> All right, next question. Michael. Okay, um, and this one is also from uh, Daniel Sturgis. Uh, will you be including water users such as domestic stock and non-municipal irrigation industrial? Ron, this was just something that we were talking about recently, and maybe you can share some of the thinking around this. Um, I'm going to probably see if Devin can pipe back in on this one, um, if that's okay, Devin. And maybe while Devin's coming on, I'll just mention because I am leading the water user interview um, portion of this, and uh, the big task right now is is figuring out, you know, who who we're who we're reaching out to, and so we are just um, the efforts of our partner aspect on this, culling through all of the GIS data that's available. Um, and engaging questions exactly like this was we really look mm -hmm. at what what are the you know what constitutes a municipal water user or a domestic water user from a small or large system that would be impacted because we are working to 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 gather information um, you know from the horse's mouth so to speak from a, a wide range of user types so that we really touch the universe of of potentially affected. Um, 
people out there. Devin, did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, Cynthia, I think you I think you said that really well. I don't think we want to leave any sort of water user group out in terms of being able to characterize all the various types of water supply that are used in the study area. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going through those um, data sets now, crunching the numbers and doing our best to make sure that the water user interviews that we conduct are going to be uh, representing um, adequately and objectively, uh, you know, the, the full scale of, of the various types of water uses in the, in the area. Maybe I'll just finish off by saying, you know, when we were um, scoping this project, um, you know, we thought a lot about how are we going to go about this and, and, you know, we'll be, we'll be conducting approximately 50 interviews. Um, as scoped, um, you know, currently in our contract, but we also, you know, recognize and it built in that, that we may learn things. We definitely will learn things through that process and may need to reach out to additional people, um, organizations. And so that's, that is something that is anticipated as part of this study. Michael, next question. Yeah, this one is from Washington Representative Mary Dye. Are you going to consider the irrigators in the Lewiston Clarkson Valley, or is this only to benefit the Columbia Snake River irrigators in the Ice Harbor and McNary pools? Well, I can touch on that one to start with. Again, the lower granite pool, you know, as far upstream as it reaches with the elevation behind lower granite dam. So the folks that are affected by that and or benefit from that pool will be included in the study. And so it just depends on whether that the group is included or to, to what degree that group is included in in that sort of vertical uh, elevation based, you know, rationale there. Great, thank you, Ron. Michael, next question. OK, um, this one is from Brett Haynes. How will the loss of flood control be quantified if the dams are removed? And has there been any thought about alternatives for flood control? Is this first question. Thanks, Roland, do you want to address that? And, and uh, I will I will address it very lightly because I recognize that the Corps of Engineers has those flood control responsibilities. But as I understand it, uh, the four lower Snake River dams uh, have have little or very minor flood control benefits. Um, I, I won't speak for the Corps on that, but our understanding is that, in the, that there's other facilities that are the flood control uh, authorized facilities, and those those are the ones. Uh, so so I, I will say as a result, um, any flood control issues um, related to these four dams um, would would need to be addressed by the core. But I, I I don't think there is really much flood control benefit, and I'm, I I don't believe there's an authorization. But I I'm speaking for myself, not for the core on that. Thank you. Okay. okay um. Yeah. Utilization of groundwater has been referred to several times as a replacement water so source for the water trap by the dams. Will this be a feasible replacement? even more so with the possible depth of the groundwater being 100 feet deeper than it currently is if the dams are, review, are removed. Ron, I think that one goes to you and Devin probably. Yeah, I think it's just uh, one of the things we're we're studying and considering, we're, you know, part of the analysis, part of the data recon that we're doing right now and gathering is, is to try to make that determination of where the groundwater is, who's using it, uh, how available that the groundwater availability is is part of what we're looking at, and it, that is going to be part of the evaluate evaluation to figure out if you know, in what cases the groundwater as a substitute water supply would be viable. Thank you. Our yeah. uh, our. Our, our aspect teaming partner and, and, and ourselves are going to be utilizing some groundwater models to try to help figure that out. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Ron. I was just going to comment on the fact that we're using some well-established regional groundwater modeling data to hone in on the potential areas of impact 
um, to you know not only validate previous assumptions on the existing body of work, but also to um, better understand what what the what the real potential for potential you know groundwater as a replacement solution might look like. Great, thank you. Michael, next question. Okay, um, so this is another question from Mr. Chartrand. Um, the Snake River dams provide irrigation water for about 50,000 acres of farmland in southeastern Washington. This water is primarily sourced from the Ice Harbor Dam Reservoir, which is part of the Lower Snake River Dam system. The total economic value of the crops grown on this irrigated land was estimated to be around 327.9 million. What other water source can replace this quantity? Ron, I think that goes back to you for just, you know, how we're going to step through this. Yeah, I think it goes back to what we've said, you know, probably a few times in different ways that it, we're just going to be looking at anything that makes sense. We're going to be, you know, including that economic analysis that helps, you know, make sure we understand all these issues that you, you referenced there with the question and trying to see what other types of scenarios with diversions out of the river at a deeper depth, or, you know, further down a uh, lower pool, so to speak, uh, or possible groundwater or otherwise, just to try to really research out what would be sensible scenarios for those kind of replacements. The water is going to be there even if the dams get breached. So it's it's not that the water won't still be flowing by. It'll just be not it won't be nearly as deep. So then it becomes a matter of infrastructure and potential effects of sediment and a couple of other issues. So if you, if you imagine that the water is still flowing by at the same rate that it was before, but just 100 feet further uh, down, then you've got to change the pumping. You've got to change the intakes uh, system. You've got to potentially deal with sediment so that you can still get it uh, just in a different fashion with a maybe different infrastructure. Thank you. And I will also add that we, we recognize that because there are pools behind those reservoirs, um, if you move to a free flowing system, uh, the you know, the the water flow isn't constant at all times of the year. So one of the other things we've asked the consultants to look at is, you know, timing of of the water flows and how that could affect any supply solutions as well. Exactly. OK, Michael, next question. OK, um, I actually think it looks like um, we've covered uh, the questions. Um, the only uh, the only thing left are comments. And again, um, the comments will be forwarded to the presenters. Perfect. All right. Well, again, I'm going to turn it back over here to, I think, probably Roland um, and maybe Tom to make a, a concluding remark. And um, I'll just say thank you to everybody for your great questions and to the team for um, your great answers. So I appreciate everyone's time this evening. Um, and Roland, I'll go back to you. Thank you, Cynthia. And Will, if I could ask you to advance the slide that has that information again. Uh, so uh, the, this, this slide deck is on the website, so you can access it there. Um, but I will just mention here at the end, I really appreciate everyone taking time with us. Uh, you know, it's in the evening hours. We wanted to make this availability to pe people who might not be available during work hours. We do have one on Thursday uh, during more of the, you know, late, later afternoon during work hours. So I just want to thank you all for making your time uh, for for sharing really insightful questions with us. Um, in addition to us just uh, giving answer to those, this has given me a number of items that we need to think about and make sure we have buttoned down well for this study. So I, I just appreciate everyone's engagement, uh, your time that, uh, that you've taken with us this evening. Uh, we really want this to be a good, strong, uh, technically valid study. So uh, appreciate everyone's uh, participation today. And I'll hand it over to Tom. 
just real quickly, uh, thank you, Roland, and I want to thank the Bureau of Reclamation and Jacobs and their subcontractors. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, and we appreciate the opportunity to share, you know, where we are starting this study and starting, you know, the, the design of this study. So uh, we appreciate your time this evening, and thank you for your input. And the, as Roland mentioned, there's another opportunity coming up uh, on Thursday. Uh, so we look forward to to uh, more discussion and more uh, input as we move this process forward. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you. Enjoy your evening, Goodbye. everybody. Bye.